relied upon. I wonder to what extent those words of warning are still properly applied across the country rather than lip service being paid to them when judges make findings based on what the child alleges in ABE interview without the allegations being tested by requiring the child to give oral evidence and have the allegations tested by cross-examination. It is a complete coincidence that a High Court judge in this audience decided in a case called B and Torbay County Council, um, Council rather, Mr Justice Goldberg, of course I'm talking about, that where children are of the age of the child in that case, rising 13, serious consideration should be given to such a child giving evidence with the usual safeguards and procedural arrangements familiar in the criminal jurisdiction. And I'm sure he won't mind me saying that that was the case which then was considered in the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal said, no, that is the wrong approach. It is an exceptional situation and a child gives evidence. But, again, I hope Paul won't mind me referring to what he said in that case, which, to me, is a chilling warning of what can go wrong. Some of you will remember that the facts of that case um, were as follows. A 13-year-old made allegations of sexual abuse. As a result of that, he was removed from his family. He was placed in foster care and a care order was made. Three or four years later, he told everyone that they were false allegations. And the judge heard that evidence, heard from the young person, and concluded that they were false allegations. And the judge said this, however good the procedures were for interviewing children, they were never more than simply interviews. They did not constitute evidence which had been tested in court. Proper investigation by such testing could cast full light on allegations of the present kind and their context. Any other process was likely to be a poor substitute. And the use of experts to produce personality profiles, for example, with the adults, had been rightly deprecated by the Court of Appeal. Even evidence from psychologists as to the veracity of the child's video evidence can tend to give an undue credibility to it. The judge was the best arbiter, and he or she needed, where possible, to hear the child. There was no substitute for live evidence. The stakes are just as high where wrong findings are made. They may not lead to false imprisonment, but the effects on the, life, on the lives and development of the child and the other children in the family who may be wrongly removed from foster care are frankly not much less draconian. The consequences for the family of false allegations are appalling. The children have been in foster care a great deal longer than they should have been and deprived of a proper relationship with their father for four years. Their father has had this terrible allegation hanging over him for four years. It has been a nightmare. An unfounded finding of sexual abuse on a stepchild is as bad a slur on anyone's character as one can imagine. The real issue here, in my view, is why should there be a distinction between the practice in the criminal courts, where children who make such allegations invariably do give evidence, whether they like it or not, and in the family courts, where we rely on the welfare of the child to say that they shouldn't, because we fear that they will be harmed by the process. It seems to me that this distinction between the two processes is no longer tenable. The <coughs> allegations the children are making have huge consequences in family proceedings. The consequences, in my view, I'm sure you would agree with me, are equally um, significant, if not more so. Now that we don't have capital punishment, the deprivation of liberty for three or four or five years for someone who is uh, convicted of sexual abuse in my view, pales into insignificance compared to losing contact with your child forever and that child being adopted. Yet the family justice system, in my view, seems too willing to allow such evidence to remain untested, despite the fact that psychiatrists specialising in the field will say that older children, and I'm really looking at teenagers in this talk, that older children can be very convincing liars. Is the basis for the distinction, namely the family court's paramount consideration being wealth of the child rather than the interests of justice, a sufficient basis, I ask? Is there sufficient and reliable research to say that the harm caused by giving evidence outweighs that of living with a false allegation? Moreover, can it really be said that it is in the best interest of the child for a vital decision about the child's life 
whether, for example, to be returned to the care of its parents, or whether to have contact with a parent, or even more simply, whether to be henceforth treated as an abused child, to be made on the basis of not the best evidence, in other words, untested evidence. These issues are invariably of great importance to the child's welfare, and does not the child's welfare demand that this evidence should be heard and tested so that the judge can make the right decision on the best evidence? Thank you very much. the allegation 